Okay, I'm going to be talking about grazing and predator prey experiments that have changed our understanding of Great Lakes food webs with a focus on the earlier years. My co authors include um, Don Scavia and Gustav Paffenhofer, who were there at the beginning. And there are many, many colleagues who collaborated later. Next slide, please. The major focus of the early work was to predict selection and consumption of food or particles by zooplankton. And I focused early on on calanoid diaptomid copepods, later working on mysis, invasive zooplankton such as bithotrephes and cercopages, and lastly, mussels and fishes. We hope the results here will inform current and future research and experimental design. Next slide. The first problem we faced is there were no satisfactory ways of measuring prey selection or how to quantify it. Don Scavey and I got together and developed three different indices, uh, WI, which is uh, equivalent to Chesson's alpha, uh, W prime, our favorite coefficient, and throughout the talk we'll be using this and you see why we like it. And lastly, we developed the relativized IVLEV index, which uh, corrected for the deficiencies that IVLEV noted in his index. Uh, in particular, since we were working on with uh, zooplankton, we focused on clearance rate relative to the highest clearance rate observed in a set of data. So we're just looking at relative clearance rates. Next slide. Uh, the early experiments involved looking at natural cestan and lake water, such as these experiments from Lake Michigan. We looked at equivalent particle, spherical diameter particles using a Coulter counter and looked at concentrations in control containers. And then thereafter, after the zooplankton fed on them for 24 hours. And these two experiments are interesting in that you have a peak in the particle size spectrum at seven micrometers as opposed to 35 micrometers here. Yet the W prime curves are remarkably similar. Next slide. The results, a summary of 23 uh, experiments from that 1981 paper showed that results of, were relatively invariant and that no focusing on peaks in the particle size spectrum, as you see here. The results were inconsistent with optimal foraging paradigms popular at the time and proposed behavioral abilities. This was results were somewhat controversial because the mechanisms were not fully explained. Was this just a function of holes in the filtering apparatus of the zooplankton? or some sensory perceptual uh, bias. Next slide. To get at the me mechanisms, uh, I worked with Gus Pavanoffer at Skidaway Institute of uh, Oceanography, and we made, made the first high-speed, high-magnification films on tethered uh, diaptomid copepods, namely our favorite study specimen, Leptodiasmus sicilis. Here is a plot of the current field around the uh, zooplankton, a current field going directly into the mouth parts, and then there's a current field below the animal. Anything on a direct line to the animal was captured passively without any apparent attempts uh, for uh, capture. When they were outside of the capture field, they sensed them and used coordinated flaps of uh, these appendages to bring them in. You might ask why are we using high speed uh, microcinematography? The uh, oscillation rate of the appendages was uh, 500 hertz or 50 hertz rather. And so you had to be able to look at millisecond scales to figure out what's going on. Uh, 
here shows a, a result that uh, Craig Williamson and I got of a diaphanous trying to catch its uh, uh, nauplius without success. Next slide. They capture, um, um, we observed uh, the W prime here as a function of passive and active captures. Prey size was important. Very small cells such as this Chlamydomonas oblonga were captured with very low uh, selectivity and they were primarily captured passively. Uh, larger cells, more and more of them were captured actively, including these phytoplankton, here Sinedra and Stephanodiscus. Highest uh, W prime was observed for the rotifer Synchita in films that uh, Craig Williamson and I did in our lab. So the factors again, prey size, prey motion, algal or prey morphology, hunger level, and taste of the uh, particle. Next slide. Early work, although focusing on natural cestan, we started moving into cultured work with cultured L algae and microscopic observations. And you notice that different uh, algae had different shapes in two or three dimensions. For example, this elongated Sinedra only showed up at having a equivalent spherical diameter of, of 15 micrometers, whereas its length was 350 micrometers in size. Uh, such elongated algae we showed were handled very efficiently by the copepods in our high speed uh, films and feeding studies. Large colonies such as Asteria nella, uh, elongated in two dimensions, foiled digestion. Here it shows an example of looking at uh, very small uh, round uh, cells. And you can see the smaller diaptimid wasn't able to ingest the large alga because it was larger than the diameter of its mouth in contrast to the larger uh, diaptimus sisalis in this, this case. Next slide. One of the things we were uh, interested in is quality of the uh, particle for in ingestion. And we did this, we looked at uh, diaphanous captures on inert particles in our high speed films. For example, we looked at microspheres, little round polystyrene uh, microspheres, as well as nylon rods we manufactured in, in the lab. And what was interesting is once the particles became larger than about 14 micrometers in size, the most of the captures were actively, including nylon uh, rods, which uh, simulated large uh, elongated algae. They were captured and handled extensively and tried to be shoved into the mouth without success. Uh, so then next slide. We repeated these uh, experiments with free swimming copepods. Here are the optics we're using our Schlieren optics, thanks to Rudy, Rudy Stricter. And we observed first demonstration of remote detection of inert particles uh, without touching mouth parts in the sensing zone. And these results imply McKenna reception is an important rapid needs means of signal detection, not dependent on prey odor. Here are a couple of scenes from the Schlieren uh, op optics. Here the animals reoriented itself. This is a circle 50 micrometer bead. This shows ultimate capture, and then we could see ultimate rejection. This is work my postdoc, Marie Bundy, took the uh, read on. Uh, next slide. Continuing the work using uh, microscopic observations of what's, what's go going on, 
we looked at our favorite uh, uh, subject, leptomyositis syphilis, feeding on protozoans during the winter-spring transition in Lake Michigan. This was during the Eagle program. And what we observed here is clearance rates on the protozoans were much higher than that on the phytoplankton in any uh, size category. In fact, although the protozoans were not very abundant, they accounted for up to 45% of the carbon intake by Leptodiathemus sicilis. I might mention also that the Leptodiathemus exerted control on the uh, uh, protozoan uh, community at, at this time. Next slide. We mentioned uh, that we liked W prime, uh, and one of the reasons we liked it was using it in food consumption in for calculating food consumption in feeding constructs. Normally, we think of as food concentration as the sum of the biomasses of the different components of the food. Well, we suggested let's use effective food concentration where the biomasses are weighted by the selectivity uh, coefficients. And then we plug this into the michaelis menten feeding uh, rate ex ex expression and look to see whether we got improvement in estimating food consumption. Next slide, please. The first demonstration of uh, this uh, concept was in uh, in situ feeding experiments that I did with uh, Jim Bowers with mysis. The pear trap uh, technique that we used involved introducing mysis in one one hat one trap and then not introducing it into the other, and then after an appropriate amount of uh, feeding, the uh, traps were hauled to the surface and the traps examined. And what we observed is we observed different W prime values for different uh, zooplankton, namely the cladosterans had the highest uh, W prime because they had poor escape mechanisms, whereas diaptimus adults, the lowest and varying life stages had different selectivities depending on their vulnerability for escape. What I show here is if the ingestion rate of moises as a function of effective food concentration. We got a very high correlation coefficient with effective food concentration and a very low correlation with total food concentration. Next slide. We extended these experiments with our favorite uh, diaptomid, leptodiaptomid, sisalis uh, feeding in mixtures of different chlamydomonas of different sizes, uh, expressing the results of the mixtures of varying uh, uh, ratios in terms of eff effective food concentration. We got a very high uh, regression uh, R squared value, value for the regression for effective food concentration, but a very, uh, a much lower uh, R squared for total food concentration. The other thing that was interesting, the results is the work with total food concentration suggested a threshold concentration before food consumption could occur. The results here for the dotted, uh, the dashed lines are for our work with Seston in Lake Michigan of those 23 experiments. The, you had a much lower uh, ingestion rate because the effect of food concentration in Lake Michigan was about 50% of that of, uh, of total food concentration. Next, next slide. We've done a number of these experiments so over the uh, years. Uh, in particular, we were interested in the non-indigenous uh, uh, visual praying food web uh, AOIs.
we have to trace which uh, our visual and what we were able to do is construct for this non-indigenous uh, food web with uh, dotted lines indicating low selectivity, dashed lines, moderate selectivity, and solid lines, high selectivity. And in a number of experiments, Steve Pothoven and I have been able to use uh, bioenergetics models and parse out the, uh, the selection for the different kinds of uh, prey. I might mention ongoing work is focusing on spatial interaction of uh, food webs. Next slide. I'm going to briefly talk about the earlier work, early, very early work with uh, rejection of cyanobacteria promoting harmful algal blooms. And you can see here a zebra mussel uh, and around it a series of dots here, which are different phytoplankton, including uh, my microcystis. Uh, well, I can see that uh, I'm not able to show the vi video, but what it would have shown is that the microcystis come into the in-current siphon and then are expelled after uh, collecting them for a while before they're actually ingested. Uh, the factors that led to the re rejection of different microcystis strains included thick mucilage around colonies, the toxin microcystin, non-microcystin irritating compounds. Uh, large colonies, once they reach a certain size, are automatically rejected. And some strains were so toxic, they shut down feeding unless alternate food was available. A lot of work is continuing by uh, many colleagues focusing on microcystis genetic traits as they relate to avoidance of predation by mussels and zooplankton. Uh, next slide. Got a minute and a half remaining, Hank. Okay, next slide. Oh, we, there we got the uh, video for some reason. <laughs> okay, uh, let, let's see if we can do it. Yeah, there you, there you go. You can see the colonies being uh, rejected. Okay, next slide, we'll get to the summary. Observations made on predator, predator capture and prey escape mechanisms are important for building models of food web interactions. These results are useful for thinking about designs of experiments using emerging technologies, such as omics tool, tools being employed by colleagues. That's it. Oh, wait a minute. Next slide, please. A, uh, this is a list of many technicians and colleagues who collaborated with me in this er early work. Next slide. Uh, any questions? All right. 